Welcome to the Data Career Podcast. Here's your host, Avery Smith. What's up, everyone? Happy Friday. I was just live just like an hour ago, and I said I'd see you after the weekend. Totally forgot that I had this awesome interview set up for the Data Career Podcast with Mark Freeman. So I'm back. Sorry, guys. Uh, Mark, welcome to the Data Career Podcast. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, guys, if you guys don't know Mark, definitely find him on LinkedIn, Mark Freeman. Connect with them. Really good resource for the data science community. Definitely someone you want to have uh, in your network. You want to check out his posts. They're really good. I'm going to give a quick bio about Mark, and then we'll get right into interviewing him and asking him some questions because he has a lot to share. But before we get going, if you are watching live, go ahead and throw a hello into the com comments. Mark and I want to know who's watching and say hello to you guys as you join in. All right. So Mark is a data scientist for a company called Humu. He has a master's in community health from Stanford School of Medicine, guys. Stanford. That's, that's the Stanford. And an undergrad in sociology from UC Davis. Mark is a fantastic resource in the data community, and I'm super excited that he's here and that we can ask him some questions. So here we go, Mark. You ready? Ready. Th thanks for that intro. Yeah, of course. All right. So I guess tell us a little bit more about this company and this role you have right now for Humu. What do you do? Well, first off, what is Humu? And then what do you do? Yeah. So Humu is a roughly 100 person startup in the Bay Area. Um, we're an HR tech company. And so essentially, we have these things called nudges. Um, which are little, little mini behavior change interventions that we send to employees, uh, I think like once a week or so. Um, and through those little mini behavior changes, we, we drive kind of like uh, organization strategy for improving work um, and culture. Um, so it's really cool because I work with a whole bunch of, uh, you know, psychologists, IO psychologists who are extremely smart and also some amazing talented engineers. And together, you know, we have these science facts kind of, uh, little packets of information that help people hopefully be happier um, and improve in their work. And um, in my role, um, I have kind of three aspects in how I support that. Um, the first one is I build data products. So this is probably one of the, my favorite things to do in my role is I actually build like production level code and I collaborate with engineering to um, create kind of data insight products that go to our end users and customers. Um, so that's been like a huge learning opportunity for me. Um, for the past year. The second thing I do is I do uh, product analytics. So I get a lot of our log data. Um, so work with engineering to determine like what logs to capture and how to bring that into our data warehouse. And then I uh, do various one-off reports. I'll create dashboards. And many times I'll help the, our VP of product help make uh, decisions. So they'll be like, hey, Mark, you know, what's happening? What's this channel for our product? Can you tell me more, Some create some insights? and really try to build a nice data narrative, data story for them to have more informed decisions how to move forward our product. And then finally, it's been like a lot of my life for the past uh, few months is I do a lot of data infrastructure. So think about ELT pipelines, um, the schema within our data warehouse, all with the goal of how can I create a framework and system to bring more data access company-wide. Um, so that's kind of the main things I do. Um, and it's probably been one of the best jobs I've had. And I've grown so much as a data scientist because I have an amazing team, amazing manager, and like I feel like very mission purpose. Um, that I build tools to help people be happy in their job, which is fun. Yeah, that is so interesting. There's a lot to unpack there. So let's let's take it one by one. Let's start with this whole nudging thing, okay? So yeah. who is sending nudge to employees? What what is a nudge? Like what? Well, what would be a nudge that I could have received today? Definitely. So I actually think, um, you know, they're, they're on our LinkedIn page for um, Humu. And also, I think you can sign up for like test nudges. You can receive a good example of it. But um, a nudge, would, I'm just making something up um, because we have psychologists who are much better at creating these things for me. But um, just the example is, you know, um, hey, you're about to be on a podcast write three things down of clear messaging you want to um, prepare for so you can like do oh. your best job, right? Um, so something along those lines where it it takes note of what you're about to currently do. And sometimes you'll see, receive nudges where your manager will receive a nudge and you'll receive a complimentary nudge before you have like a one-on-one. -on -one. 
So there's various different things. And like long-term wise, like for, for a data scientist, how we can impact is like, what's the most impactful nudge at the right time? Can we send someone um, to, to drive behavior change? That, that's a really interesting data problem that we're working towards. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Very interesting. Um, so it integrates with, with your calendar or your schedule in some way. It kind of knows what you're doing. Not, um, not, uh, that's not yet. I don't know if that's on our product roadmap or anything okay, like that, yeah. but I was just giving an example. Eventually um, that's things. the idea. Man, okay. that would be cool. That would be cool. I'll, I'll bring that back to them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I could see like, yeah, that I could see that getting kind of interesting too, because it could be like, Oh, you have a meeting with Joe coming up and Joe has like a little bit of a red personality. Just like, remember, he doesn't always mean what he says. I don't know. I, yeah. I think that, there, that's there's very There's so interesting. many opportunities. I think that the key thing with my role currently is like thinking strategically, like what data signals can we capture? What product features can we build to like make people want to engage and like provide that data? Because it's a trust between us, um, you know, giving us your data, but also us providing those key insights. Um, so it's, it's an interesting problem being at this stage of like an early stage kind of data strategy and data implementation of things. Um, because, you know, unlike Facebook or Amazon, some large company, they have all this data. So there's like mining through it for us. We're like, we have to create the data. And so um, it's, it's really interesting uh, being at this stage for a data scientist. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, there's, there's a lot we can get into there because it sounds like, yeah, I working for a small company in a startup, you do a lot of, like you said, you wear a lot of hats, you mm -hmm. have a lot of different activities. Um, so we can definitely get into that uh, later in the pod, but I'd love, I'd love to, well, I'd love to say hello to everyone watching. So we have uh, Abu Yodin. Thanks for watching. And we got Blaine Prickett. I think Blaine and I met on, on TikTok actually. So what's good, Blaine? Hope Amazing. Well. Yeah. I know. Uh, I love TikTok. How do you TikTok. like that platform, by the way? Oh, oh love I love TikTok. It sucks up so much of my time. So I, I shouldn't <laughs> love it as much as I should. Uh, but I, it's fascinating. Okay. Yeah. Um, I would love to hear how you got to Humu. But let's go all the way back. Like, how did you get into data in the first place? Because, you know, when we went back to your bio, we had an undergrad in sociology. And I think a master's in community health or something like that. So how yes. <laughs> did you end up where you're at? Because it doesn't seem like that was the path. I don't know. There, there's actually like a linear path somehow uh, of just following my passions. But uh, for the longest, I thought I was going to be a doctor. And so I did my undergrad sociology, but I was also taking pre-med courses. Oh. Um, <laughs> fun fact, I wasn't the best student. So like I bombed a lot of my science classes. Um, and so I was actually applying to post -backs to like, improve your GPA to get into medical school. Gotcha. And um, at the same time, I was working at Stanford at the Social Impact Center, the Haas Center for Public Service. And I was like, does Stanford have an MPH program? Let me check it out. And they didn't, but they had this thing called Community Health Prevention Research. And I read it and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I want to do with my career in medicine and healthcare. And it just aligned so well. So I applied as a long shot. I wasn't even planning on trying to go to get my master's or anything. It was the only program I applied to. And I got in. Um, the funny thing though is once I got in, I was at the school of medicine, I was taking classes across the medical students. I realized I did not like grad school. I loved learning, but the process of grad school is just so grueling for me. And I was like, I can't do four more years of this. I, I don't want to be a doctor anymore. Um, which is like a big thing because all my mentors were doctors. All my peers were going to medical school. And so just really <laughs> shifting away and just starting over again. Um, not fully starting over, but like starting over with my connections and my network because it's going to be a completely different industry. Um, and so top of my head, I was like, all right, I can code in R. I have these research skills, experimental design skills. I'm at Stanford where it's very embedded in tech. Um, but more importantly, I have the sociology background and the thing reason I got into healthcare is for community impact. And so I was thinking, you know, we call it like the social determinants of health. You know, there's all these different uh, community aspects that drive your health. So where you live, your access to things. And so I was thinking to myself, like, where are these disparities going to be embedded and scaled up in the future? And it really hit me personally. I was like, wow, it's going to be data. Data is driving so many different aspects of our lives. Um, and the things that are training these models, training 
and forming these decisions are based off data that has a lot of bias in it. it may not include people, may reaffirm like old laws that are maybe uh, um, discriminatory. Uh, and I was like, I need to get involved in this. And so this became my passion. I was like, I want to get into data science to actually have like social impact at scale. And it just seemed like combined all my skill sets with my love for business, social impact, and all these different things. Um, and so that's that was the start of like, I want to become a data scientist. Surprisingly, after my master's, I, I didn't get into a data role. My first job out of my master's is in an operations role in, uh, at a health tech company for like health insurance, um, out of all things. But I took the train. I took the train from uh, Palo Alto, which is where Stanford's at, to San Francisco, because I'm in the Bay Area. And so that's an hour train ride each way. And I start teaching myself Python on the train. Okay, um, hold on, hold on, hold on. Pause, 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 pause. Lots, I, got, I got to unpack some stuff here. Yeah. But you, knew, you, knew, you knew R already, though, right? Yeah, I knew R already because- From um, undergrad? From grad school. All my stats oh. classes just assumed you knew R. And oh. so the lectures were in R. The tests were in R and I didn't know R. So it was like, I want to be a data scientist. I need to get into this class to take all these advanced statistics courses. I'm, I guess I have to learn R. <laughs> and so I just self-taught myself. So I was, I, was, I was passionate about it then. I was just obsessed with learning R and learning statistics. I wasn't good at it at first. I was just persistent. Um, I spent like 20 hours outside of class teaching myself R. Um, uh, Brandon Fult, his YouTube page was how I learned statistics. Um, who's, who's, sorry, who is that? Brandon Fultz, uh, he, he, I did a live stream with him, I think last month. Uh, but, and that was, like a, that was like such a full circle moment because I looked up to him so much because he like taught me statistics. Yeah. Uh, and got me prepared for my grad school level courses. Uh, so, so yeah, that's how I learned ours just through uh, my grad program, but also forcing myself to be in positions where I had to learn R. So I took the stats course that required it for my thesis, I said, I'm going to do a, a statistical analysis, even though I don't know statistics yet. If I make this my thesis, it's going to push me to do it anyways. Okay. I love a couple things about that. One, I love that you were taking classes that you were not qualified for. Not at all. <laughs> I, I, I love that. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this is ours a requirement. Oh yeah, I know that. And it's like, you'll just figure it out along the way. I think yeah. uh, that, that, uh, I don't know if it's a skill or it's a characteristic, but the ability to just be like, you know what? I can figure it out, everything that I need to figure out as I go. Um, I think that serves people really well in the data community. So that's that's really cool. Um, okay, so then, so then, okay, so then you graduate and you get a job mm -hmm. at some health insurance something or other. Um, yeah, health insurance tech company doing operations. So not even and are you, related, where are you living? Uh, still in the Bay Area, so I was still in uh, in Palo Alto, which is right next to Stanford, because uh -huh. um, I still I still have my housing that was super cheap over yeah. there. Uh, <laughs> Bay Area rent is crazy. Yeah, um, but it, my job was in San Francisco, so it has a thing called uh, okay. Caltrain, which is the train that goes both ways, and so uh -huh. hour each way. And I was like, I'm gonna teach myself Python on the train. I'm using most what? of my hour. Why did you want to learn Python? You already knew R. Yeah, well, the thing is, is learning about data science. I was like. Well, I need to know R and I need to know Python. And a lot of the job descriptions showed both. And uh, I thought it would be a good skill to have to know Python, um, especially for like scripts. My understanding back then was like, you know, R is for statistics, Python's for like building applications. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you saw it on job, job requirements. You're like, I'm going to learn them both. Um, yeah. at, at this point, how did, I mean, like, you you kind of knew you wanted to go in data into data because you wanted to use those those three things you said earlier like the sociology and the health and you had kind of these programming skills you thought why not is that why you were drawn towards data science or, or why were you drawn towards data science i think it provided the combination of statistics which i just fell in love with um coding uh business um mm, business. and finally um scaling social impact okay those are okay. because it did all of that in one job. Um, because I love talking to people, I love making connections and communicating things. Um, and so statistics and coding by itself wouldn't allow me to do that. So data science was this bridge to allow me to engage in all these asset aspects of my life that I enjoyed. Okay. So okay, now now I'm a little more clear. You have these four things going on in your head. You're like, these four things I want to do. 
data science seems like a great place to do all four of those things. Mm -hmm. And you're commuting an hour every day. So you're learning Python. Okay. So yeah. keep going. What happens next? I'm ready. Definitely. So I start, I'm in operations. So a lot of the works in Excel, I start automating my workflows with Python after I learned it. Um, so big shout out to pandas. Um, really, really helped me out with that. And I started sharing with my colleagues and they start automating their work. So I was like saving like tens of hours a week through these Python scripts I've built just that I just learned a couple months ago. Um, and so that was happening at the same time. I was like, I have this mentality of like, if I give an employer 40 hours, I'm gonna invest in myself 10 hours. So that was the Python. And I was like, I really wanna jump in and understand this data career is actually a good fit for me. I picked up a second job as a research data analyst that's back at Stanford. Um, for 10 hours a week, I was doing R statistics and run these analyses for this research lab. And that was my first jump in as like a career as a data professional. And it proved two things for me. One, I was capable of doing this as a job, but more importantly, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> and it really started to click in, click in my head. I was like, wow, by the hour, I'm being paid more as a data analyst I enjoy this way more. Like I just, I need to jump in and make this happen. Oh, interesting. So you still had your, your full-time job, yep. but then you took on this part-time job, which was at the university, which I'm yep. guessing had pretty lax, you know, pretty, 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 uh, loose, uh, structure in terms of when you work and where you work. Is that true? Or? Exactly. It, it was remote and I just tracked my there own hours. Go. Yeah. Um, and it was all through video. So before pandemic times, you know, I was already <laughs> doing the remote thing. And the thing uh, is like, you, you, you build a reputation about yourself. So like they, they asked my, my, uh, former professors and also I had another recommendation from someone who worked in a lab. They're like, yeah, we, we trust Mark. Um, he will get the job done. Okay. So you yeah. never know who's watching <laughs> and who can be a connection who can advocate for you. Um, it's so it was, true. And it was interesting because it, it was, it was in the same department as my grad program. And so, before they hired me, they say like the the person who, who's gonna be my manager for that role, she uh, she went to my old stats professor, and it was just such a full circle moment for me because she said, you know, we're gonna take a risk on you because you never had a statistics role before. So I went to your old professor and asked like, how was Mark? And and this professor actually helped me out on my thesis quite a bit, and he's like he's like one of the best stats students I've ever had, um, which is like so wild to me because I was like I struggled so much early on. But because I was so persistent and kept on asking for help and built this relationship with this professor, um, I ended up learning quite a bit um, for this. And so that, that kind of buy-in got me that job. That's such a good point because the, the best jobs you get in your life are ones you never apply for. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's so true. It's the ones that were, you just utilize your network and this, this person's looking for someone and you can do that. Those, those always end up the best jobs, but those jobs are impossible to try to get kind of, because it mm -hmm. takes like a year of a relationship building, right? And you just never know what's gonna come from each relationship. Like, yeah. like you could have had no relationship with your professor and that would have led nowhere, right? Like nothing would have happened. But because you had been putting time with your professor, you know, just as a genuine person asking him questions or her asking them questions, them asking you questions, um, you know, and just getting to know each other that ended up leading to a role that, okay, I haven't heard the end of your story necessarily, but it sounds like this is a pretty trans transformational role and, you know, yeah, it was vital to your career. Yeah. It was a proof point for me. Uh, and I'll go into this more, but like definitely had a lot of imposter syndrome. I think grad school was really hard for me. Um, I almost dropped out. Uh, and it just took a lot out of me and I just lost a lot of my confidence after grad school. And so, uh, you know, taking small steps, I knew I, I would succeed, but I lost that spark of like that. I, that I will succeed if I try. And so yeah. it was just a nice step to say like, if I do this, can I succeed? And it, it gave me that positive kind of like, like a little mini hypothesis test. Like, will I do this? Right. Um, and it was only 10 hours and it didn't work. I was on a small contract. Yeah. Yeah, ex exactly. You, 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 th this, this is actually be really important with the rest of our conversation. You dipped your toe in, in a very low risk, uh, situation to figure out what the, if you liked it and if it made sense for your career. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Keep going. So you're at this analyst job. You're, you're like the pay is better. The work's more fun for me. Yeah. What's next? 
Um, and so eventually, uh, you know, I was like, all right, I'm gonna make this jump. Um, and so I quit my full-time job. I still have my part-time job as a data analyst and I, I did a data science bootcamp. Uh, oh, wow. You went I, straight into the bootcamp while keeping, were you still 10 hours a week at the, at the analyst or? Yeah, I was still 10 hours a week, um, on the okay. side for that. So, okay. uh, so then I do, do the bootcamp and that, that was an interesting experience. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you decide, okay, I want to make data more of a role in my life. You already had yep. a master's degree, so that probably ruled out the master's, right? Yeah, I already had a master's degree. I had the experimental design. I had the statistics. I already know how to code in Python. I already know how to code in R. So you were like, I just need this to happen and yeah. happen fast. And it seemed like, I mean, what, what were you hoping to get out of the boot camp? I guess? I think the biggest thing, um, and I think this alludes to your the title of this, is this 20K mistake. I was trying to buy job connections um, mm. and I I was trying to force this situation to get a job. And I felt like this was the, at that time, I felt like that was the best thing for me to do is pay this large sum to go through this program to refine my skills and get connected to the job pipeline to land a job. So I thought it would reduce my risk in, in making that happen. Okay, so that was that was the most important thing to you was like, I want to have, you know, good connections and good job leads coming out of this boot camp because, like yep. you said, you knew you knew Python, you knew SQL, you had some of the stats. Um, so that's, I mean, that's a big part of, of yeah. data science. And I, mean, I had a paid data role where I was driving value. True. I mean, you already had some some experience. You didn't need yeah. the first. The first job is always kind of the hardest. So you kind of had the yeah. uh, the first the first job. Eddie, yeah. Eddie and I Martin. turned my operations role already into a into a uh, into a data role. And so all my True. resume, people just assume that my operations role was a data role because I implemented all these Python scripts that drove value. Yes. That's such a good point. That and this is this is everyone who's listening. You really need to take Mark's example here. Was Mark on paper when they handed you a contract? Was that a data role? Not at all. I made it a data role, and I was very upfront. I told him when I took that job, I was like, I want to be a data scientist. Um, and I, I told every manager, like, that's what I'm trying to do. And it was really cool is that my manager at the time, shout out to my manager at that job. She used to be a software engineer and she didn't like software engineering. So he went, she went into management and she like fully supported that. She's like, yeah, I totally built this script. That'd be awesome. Um, looking back, that was such a bad script. It's, it was really poor <laughs> code, but they weren't software engineers. They didn't know there was no difference either. They're like, cool, I run in the terminal, it works, it gives me the Excel output I need and it saves me 10 hours, so they didn't care. I'm with you, that's uh, that's very true of my my first code that I wrote. It, Man, it would yeah. not pass any sort of yeah. quality but test. But the, the key thing is that it did an end-to-end -end task and it drove value for my end user. Yeah, and that's all that counts, especially, especially when it's not an official data role. It's just like, mm -hmm. okay, I am, you're in operations, okay? You, but everyone, whatever your role is, whatever your industry you're in, you know, if you're an engineer, if you're, you know, a scientist, if you're in operations, whatever, you need to think, okay, I am a scientist with data skills. I'm an engineer with data skills. Because I always say this, I hate the title data scientist. And I hate that it's like a data scientist is someone who does data science. It's not true. It's like saying yeah. a mathematician are the only people who do math. And it's like, well, no, there's so many roles that use math and there's so many roles that can use data science. And sometimes we just limit ourselves. Oh, since I'm not a data scientist, I can't do data science. But guys, look at Mark's example here. He had a role that maybe didn't even have historically any sort of significance in the data sense, but he found ways to improve and bring value while fulfilling his duties in that role with the idea in the back of his head, I'm in operations, but I want to think and act like a data scientist. I think that's such a good example and people should really should really emulate that. Yeah, I mean, and go, go on to my LinkedIn, um, that job was collective health and to see how I put the bullet points of how I describe my role and you can see for yourself how you can ensure to do that. And it's, it's all about spinning and, and selling yourself. Um, that was probably like 5% of my job. Yeah. But I just highlighted those three things because I was trying to go for a data career. Yeah, that's that's also a really good skill to have, right? Were you a waiter or did you serve hundreds of customers a day to give them great satisfaction? You know, it's like 
both of those things could be true, but it, but the, the bullet points in your resume, you really need to tailor to the job you want to have. Uh, don't lie, never lie, but stretch the truth <laughs> or, yeah. or, or spin it or make it sound. <laughs> we a get what better. you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Quick side note, just one quick tangent. Like yes. my food service jobs has been probably the most impactful thing for my role in like corporate. Why? Uh, because I had so much customer service experience. I just know how to talk to people and sell things now. Um, when you're a cashier, you have to upsell, you know, like, hey, you want those extra pickles or something like that? Like, it's only 25 cents more. You, you ordered it last time you are here. So. I mean, that, that's a good point. And, um, so yeah, you know, never, I'll, never discount your, your previous skills, even if it's not as, like, as fancy as a data role. Like, I rely on my skills from food service all the time. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. I don't know if those skills are as valued by recruiters as much as they should be, because you are right that, like, you know, I've through what I do now on LinkedIn and, and talking to people, you know, I've talked to, you know, a couple hundred data scientists um, and not all of them have the same sociability that, that you do, Mark. Like <laughs> data scientists yeah, and- are often really nerdy and often really <laughs> introverted and it's hard for them to communicate well. And so if you can do the technical side of data science and you have like a personality and you're like sociable, that goes a long way, doesn't it? Yeah. And maybe you can't put it on your resume, but it gives you yeah. the confidence that you have transferable skills to succeed in a new environment. Yeah. And once and and also a resume is like it's it's like a stupid key to to get into a door. You have to like twist it. But but once you're in the door, the resume doesn't matter as much as your personality. Mm-hmm. So once you meet someone face to face, communication really, really stands out. I, I yeah. liked I liked that tangent. That was that was a good tangent. Um, okay, so I, I just wanted to say uh, Eddie Martinez is here, a Dominican based in Liverpool. Um, what's good, Eddie? I was just in the Dominican Republic a month ago. B- very beautiful country. Um, but he said, aboard the Boot Camp Express. Um, so yes, Mark, you're getting on the boot, the boot Camp Express here. You, you sign up for this boot camp. You're looking for job leads. How How is the experience? Honestly, um, it just wasn't a good experience for me, unfortunately. Uh, I think, you know, they're, they're, they're a startup themselves. And so they're trying to figure, figure out things. And I think just my cohort, I think the job pipeline just wasn't there at the moment. And so, uh, you know, the thing I paid for, uh, you know, it just didn't work out for that round that I was in. Um, it was pretty, pretty unfortunate, uh, for that. So I have like really mixed feelings about the boot camp I did because, um, you know, I think, I think if I was more strategic and really thought about it, I don't think I would I would pay as much as I did for for that. And so um, that's why I say like it's like a, a twenty thousand dollar mistake. It was like seventeen k for my loan, but interest will probably be above twenty k. <laughs> um, but I think you know, and the biggest thing is not it's not on them. It's one hundred percent on me. Um, that's one of the key things I want to highlight. But I think I think three main lessons really came was looking back. I wrote them down because I didn't want I didn't want to forget is that yeah, let's hear um, I think the biggest thing is I, I didn't do my due diligence um, for the program. Um, you know, typically in California you have like these uh, like required by law to give you like what's the placement rate of people who graduate into a into a role within like 90 days or like one year or whatever it may be. Um, you could potentially interview potential students on LinkedIn. You could like reach out and talk to them. Um, you could actually talk to the program itself to learn more and talk to get a feel for it, right? Um, but I think the biggest thing is that I didn't do a cost benefit. I was just so hyper focused on this one program that I didn't consider like what are the other programs I could do with seventeen k, right? So I think this program would have been great if I didn't pay so much uh, for it. Because um, I think uh, I was talking to other people like seventeen k, you can get a whole master's <laughs> at a state school for that price. Um, yeah. And actually, I actually didn't complete this program. Um, something that was interesting is I, so context wise, I got married, <laughs> I quit my job, <laughs> and I'm doing this program. And then my wife, unfortunately, had some health issues where she couldn't work anymore. She's okay now. So like, it was like a do or, sink or swim moment. <laughs> and so yeah, I was wow. like, I need a job or I'm yeah. moving back into my parents' room with my wife. Yeah. Um, which is a great start for our marriage. Yeah. Um, Everyone wants but, to live with their in-laws the first, the first year of marriage. That's for sure. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so 
I, I came to a choice. It's like, if I, if I knew, if I continue in this program, I'll learn some cool data science stuff, but I won't get a job and I'll be in a bad position or I switch gears and I make this program maybe 25% of my time and the other 75%, I'm just going hard on LinkedIn and, and applying for jobs. And that bet work, worked out. I ended up getting a job outside of the program. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't get my certificate from the program, but ultimately it all worked out. Um, so I think that was a due diligence. I think the other aspect looking back is, you know, my decision was really driven by insecurity. Uh, you know, I said like after grad school, I really lost a lot of my confidence. So like thinking about my skill set, like R, Python, I have put, you know, working professional and data already part time, uh, was able to turn my other role into a data role, essentially, uh, you know, have the experimental design with a master's. Like I had all the skill set, right, to, to get in there. Um, I just didn't have the confidence. I, I thought I just couldn't apply myself. Um, I thought I needed this extra, extra push. And I think this bleeds into the next kind of component was like, I was just really impatient. I wanted it to happen now. And if I was more patient, I probably could have saw like, hey, I actually have this skill set. And if I augment it in this cheaper way, I could probably get the same results. Um, it won't be as uh, as quick as this timeline I wanted. And so I think looking back, especially for people in trying to make the shift into their career, um, a piece of advice I tell a lot of people is that the moment before you reach a goal is when you're most vulnerable. Um, because, you know, it's it's a frustrating time because like I have the skill already, like, but I don't have the results to show for it. And when you're so close, that's when that's the peak of like your skill before you break through. And there's a lot of frustration around that. And you're like, I want to have this happen now. And you know, there's there's two things. You get frustrated and quit, or you get frustrated and you make bad decisions or you rush decisions because you're trying to push through. And uh, I did the latter. Uh, and I just wasn't strategic with my career choice. Thankfully, it all worked out. I learned a lot from the program. It just didn't get the, I just, for what I paid for, what I was hoping to gain from it, I just didn't get. Um, but, you know, it was just a lesson learned um, early in my career. And now I have this lovely loan I pay off every month. <laughs> yeah, man. I, I, I'm sorry that happened, but I'm glad it all worked out in, in the in the end for you. And I, it's hard to know what happened if you, it's, it's hard to, to go. I mean, right. Hindsight is 2020. It's hard to know yeah, exactly. if you would have gone back. Okay. But let's, 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 let's put that aside. You said, all right, screw it. I'm going to find my own job. And you said you went quote hard on LinkedIn. What yes. worked for you and what didn't work for you? Definitely. So the advice I received, uh, you know, I was just networking with people and uh, I talked to someone, he was like the head of data science at the startup. And the first thing he says, like, look, I don't have a job for you, but I have this key piece of advice. Go find 10 companies that are just doing really cool stuff and just, just send a cold email to the decision maker and say, like, this is my skill set. This is what I can get for your company. It, regardless or not, they have a job. And that's exactly what I did. I found 10 companies that are health tech companies that are really cool. And I just pitched myself really hard, um, basically doing like an SDR role. Um, for myself of just selling myself saying like, Hey, here's my skill set. Here's my resume. This is where I think aligns with your company. Um, let's schedule a time to talk. So it wasn't even asking like, Hey, do you want to talk? It's like, let's schedule a time to talk. Um, one of those companies was, uh, my first role with Verona health. Um, and it was such a, it was, they gave me my first break as a data scientist. I'm very thankful for that. Um, and that's, that was through LinkedIn completely just doing emails on LinkedIn. And um, not waiting for a job application, but saying like, like just going after the people that I thought was great alignment. And they specifically said like, oh, we don't have the job posting up. We're going to put it up next week. So like, let's talk. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. Um, a couple, congratulations. And that's, that's such a cool story. Um, a couple things I want to highlight there, or I want to ask you about. So you talk to some director guy, he's like, hey, I don't have a job, but send you know, 10 cold emails to companies you sound interested in. And one of them ended up giving you a job. What did you say in, in those emails? And was there anything special about this one that ended up, wh why do you think that one company went with you? Yeah, definitely. So uh, if you give me, I can probably share my screen. Yeah. I, I had a post I made like a year ago, if I can try to find it, where I basically broke down the process of doing that email. Would that be helpful? 
Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can share your screen um, while you're pulling it up because everyone who's watching, if you're not posting content on LinkedIn, often start posting content on LinkedIn. But here's a word of advice. Put that content somewhere where it's searchable because if you want to try to find a post from a year ago on oh. your LinkedIn, it's a little bit easier. You want to find it on someone else's LinkedIn? Gosh, it is it's impossible. Rough. LinkedIn, if you're listening, please make a searchable oh archive. I wish I had the plug for LinkedIn. because There's so many things I wish for, for content creators that just don't have. Yeah. So there's actually, there's a plugin. Well, it's a separate service called Shield Analytics and they make uh, your, they make your archive searchable, um, awesome. but, it's, but it's like 30 bucks a month. So I do not get it anymore. I did for like two months and I was like too much. Um, Okay, while you're pulling that up and take your time, uh, I actually, it's, it's interesting that, you know, I think cold emailing and cold messaging is underrated um, mm -hmm. because that's actually how I got my first engineering job. Um, I, was, I was a freshman in college and I had zero experience in terms of like science or engineering or math. I just had high school and I worked at a gym and I played a lot of soccer. That's like... That was my resume basically. And I really wanted to work in college. And for some reason I was like, I need to be a scientist or an engineer. And so I cold emailed 20 professors and I was like, Hey, let me, let me work in your lab. Um, and I think out of the 20, I think three replied. One was a no. One was a, here's a position, ironically, a data analysis position. I met with her. She said, I wasn't like prepared. I wasn't ready which I would love to go back to her now and be like, am I ready now? But she, <laughs> she was right. Like Sign I, that contract. <laughs> yeah, she was like, do you know how to program? I was like, not really. So uh, that was, that was not good. And then the third one was just a random metallurgical engineer professor. And he gave me a chance to work on paid for three months. And basically those three months I owe the rest of my career to, cause it all built on top of each other. So cold emails underrated. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so I found the post real quick. Sweet. Uh, you want, you want to press that screen. share? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Share screen. Let's see. Awesome. Can you see my screen? Yep. So uh, quick context. So at my job, Rana Health, I was unfortunately laid off in the middle of the pandemic from this role. Oh, bummer. Uh, which is really, but ended up being one of the best things ever. So what I did, thinking about LinkedIn content, I created a post called the Layoff Hustle where every single day I was going to document how I, from day one, from being laid off to me getting my, my job, which ended up. Oh, that's cool. So, and I can go, I can go specifically into that strategy afterwards, but I wanted just to highlight one yeah. of these posts that I created. Um, so you can see like the layoff hustle, but um, you know, if you've been laid off, you have to master the art of the email. So here's my template. So I say, hello, name of contact. I'm reaching out to my interest in this position with the company. And I specifically highlight key points that I've shown that I've done my research um, of what's special about them and aligns my certain skill. So with my passions here, I give a quick background about myself that aligns with the role. So I received my education, whatever background that specialized in this. I remember keying back to what the job description or what the, the company's mission is. Um, again, providing a couple of contexts, so basically two points. I truly believe it would be a strong asset to your company with the ability to, and I describe again, connecting it. How can I drive value for that company? And here's the key point is this is the call to action right here is I'm excited about the opportunity and certain that I can provide value to your team. I'll be very interested in scheduling an interview at your earliest convenience and to further learn about this position. And I attach my resume. You're hired. You're hired. <laughs> that, no, that's, that's really good. Um, Keep, keep it up for a second. Keep it up for a second. Okay. Um, for those, for those of you, you know, who are like, who, who find this useful. And I think if you're looking for any job or you want to transfer your career, I think you should. Uh, and if you're watching, look at these little alligator eater brackets that he's talking about. This is a specific message to this specific person. He, he did his research, you know, Mark went and figured out what was cool about this company and how he could bring value to that company. He did not copy and paste the same generic crap to a hundred different people. He chose 10 people he was interested in 
and made it, you know, specific, you know, he wrote almost a new email. I mean, the template, you know, really helps, but those, those customized sections are so important. And that's what makes, you know, a good application from a bad application. Um, I, you know, I've been hiring a little bit here and there uh, for my analytics firm and I get these messages on LinkedIn all the time and it is so copy paste. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, one time someone asked to speak with the hiring manager and I'm like, uh, I'm a one man show. <laughs> I am the hiring manager. And if you spent five seconds on LinkedIn, you would figure that out. Like, it's not like, it looks like I run like a corporation, like, dude, like you, and um, automatically I would never consider that person. Cause they just, they just proved they have no attention to detail. Right. If I, if I can't trust you to send a good email, how can I trust you, you know, with hundreds, not hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands of dollars of projects. I wish hundreds, hundreds of hundreds thousands of dollars, <laughs> millions of dollars. Let's put that yeah. energy out there for you. Avery. Yeah. I like that. Maybe, maybe in the future, but I am not making hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, uh, not hundreds, maybe millions, but no, just kidding. But yeah, like the cold email you have, it's so effective, but it has to be specific. Otherwise mm -hmm. it is a, it is spam otherwise, in my opinion. Yeah. And the key thing too, that I want to highlight is that you need to find the decision maker. Um, hiring is super hard. Uh, we're, we're currently hiring for my team at, at, at Humu and we're doing it for, for a couple months now. Plug and, anyone know, who wants to be hired at Humu. <laughs> you know, senior role, it's super fun. It's one of the best jobs I've ever had. Um, and my manager is awesome. So you get to work with an awesome manager. Um, quick plug, humu.com. I love this. Yeah, um, but uh, you need to find a decision maker because if you, you're you basically spoon feeding them key kind of sound bites that they can take back to their team to advocate for you. And so if you make their job of hiring easier, you're already in a good light. You're already winning um, because you've, you've already described like what's the pain point, how you drive that value. You've, you've already sourced yourself for them. And now all they need to do is just repeat what you said to them to the other hiring people. And this makes their job significantly easier. So um, who, who, who have you found to be like the person, like who's the best person to find on LinkedIn, right? Cause you could like yeah. search by role. Is it the hiring manager or is it like a team lead or? Yeah, so again, you, you have to, to do your research. So okay. my, my strategy is like, I like startups. So this may be different for other types of companies, but I'll go on Crunchbase, um, which is like a startup website and I'll find yeah. names of startups. Um, and then especially if they have like news about like they just closed around or something like that. Yeah. So they're probably be hiring a lot um, or they're a certain size. They've been around for, for a little bit. Um, and then I essentially try to find either the, if it's a very small startup, it's to be like a CEO, CEO, very small. So like, the Avery Me. Smiths yeah. of, <laughs> of the internet, of, of the yeah. data world, right? Um, and they're, they're, I imagine, very stressed because you have so much on your plate. So again, if you can just like fill their need, they're like, great, let's talk. Like, I don't have to look for someone. You already showed up, right? Um, if it's a little bit larger, maybe there's a technical, um, a technical recruiter or just a recruiter in general, um, making sure it's the right, the right fit uh for that so they'll, they'll work with the hiring manager and then the next step is just find, maybe finding the the data science manager the data team manager and reaching out directly to them and here's the thing like you'll get a lot of no's and that's okay it's just you need to get the one yes and um, i actually have a specific strategy i can go into of like how i make that happen and how you can like systematize this whole process um would you, would you want me to yeah, I, be I'm useful curious. for this? Yeah, yeah. yeah so uh, I showed you like the layoff hustle. Um, I did something wild. So middle of the pandemic, I was laid off. And so, and my wife's made, so again, my wife's still not working at this time. So it's like, I, I need to make this work. Um, and it, she always believes in me. I, I said, I'm gonna do something wild. I'm not gonna send a single job application um, to get hired. Uh, and essentially what I do is I'm going to create a sales funnel to drive myself into getting a job. And so I believe it's like the ADA method. So it was awareness, interest, desire, and action. And so I built a sales funnel for my job search via LinkedIn. 
And so instead of sending an application, I made one piece of content that was super engaging and drove value for someone to build awareness of my brand and being aware that I'm looking for a job. And so through that, I just put out a piece of content with a call of action. Um, I, I noted that I was laid off and that I was currently searching. And so people in my network start sending me leads, hiring managers came in my email. And so by building that awareness, um, I built interest, people went into my end mail. And so that was that interest step. And so then I described the value I can bring. Like, hey, here's my skill set. This is what you're currently working on. Let's discuss. That would turn into the interview step. So desire, can I communicate my needs to this hiring panel that I have the skill set that solves a problem? And finally, action, the negotiation step of like signing a contract of, of doing that. And so if you switch from being like, I'm an employee to I'm a business of one selling my services to potential employers, it allows you to take more action. And so what I really liked about this breakdown was it gives me levers to pull on. So maybe I'm getting a lot of leads, but I'm not getting past the interview step. That informs me that I can keep up my process, but I need to focus my time on building my interview skills. Or maybe I'm getting to like the negotiation stage and I'm not be able to communicate the value I can bring to get actual contract that I want. For, for employment, right? And so maybe I need to work on better refining what my ask is. And so by using those levers, it just becomes a numbers game. Um, Cause I have this funnel, I know what, what my percentage of turnover is for each, not turnover, but like uh, to get to the next level. And so that just means like, if I want a, a offer, I need to send in like a hundred in, in mails or make a hundred posts. And I know I can get this offer. That's, that's crazy. So. And very cool and very yeah. smart. And that's how I met Humu. Humu came into my email um, and, you know, or one of my friends from an old job connected me and that's how we talked. So I didn't send a single application for that, that job. I, I had interviews at multiple companies. But yeah, that's, that's always better when you have people coming to you than you going to the companies. It's always, you're like, I'm going to make up the stat, but you're like 20 times more likely <laughs> to get hired. That's what it feels like anyways. It feels like um, it. It feels like it. Yeah. So, but hold on, go back to this, this sales funnel thing. Mm -hmm. You used your LinkedIn. Is that what you're saying? Yep. I use my LinkedIn. So you create really with my post, I was going to post every single day with the goal of uh -huh. driving to give some, at least one person value. Uh -huh. So it was really like creating content about how to best um, get a job or how to, be, how to do this data skill. So like really cementing myself and being able to exhibit that, A, I'm able to communicate these concepts. I'm able to put myself out there um, and then also draw people in. And so it was a risky move, but I was on LinkedIn for a while. I had a pretty wide network, but that was my first step of actually being active on LinkedIn, heavy from like from a creator standpoint. Interesting, yeah. I, I for some reason, even putting posts out to the universe, um, I was looking for a job about a year ago um, I knew I was going to leave Exxon. I was still figuring out what I was going to do. And I, I just turned on, like, I'm open to recruiters. Um, and I, I could not tell you, I probably got two to three recruiters in my inbox a day. And I don't think I'm anything special. It's just, I post it on LinkedIn every day, you know? Yep. And, and I think, I don't know if that just like affects the algorithm or I don't know what it is. LinkedIn's like, oh, this person's using LinkedIn. So we give back to them via you know, recruiters. I have, don't know. I have no but idea. Yeah, you, you build that awareness. And here's the thing, like I use LinkedIn posts for me, but there's another way to build awareness is through those emails. So doing those target emails, basically your, your uh, SDR and sales, and you're essentially sending out cold calls to drive people into that funnel. So did you have LinkedIn premium for a couple months then to, uh, yeah, I, I did the, I did the, the, the free trial. Version, the yeah. Free trial. Basically, guys, if you didn't know this already, if you want to try out LinkedIn Premium, you can get a free trial. I think it's a 30 days or something like that. Sometimes days. I do you specials. Um, but then then you can cancel after 30 days. And then mm -hmm. when when you hit cancel, they're like, oh, we'll give you one more free month. At least that's how it usually is. So you get two, two free months of LinkedIn and then you can cancel it then. And then like wait a month and they'll send you some in like, email like, Hey, we miss you on premium. Do you want a free month? <laughs> like you can, you can finagle your way into it. Yeah. But yeah, I just using that funnel. And the, the key thing is how can you build awareness either through organic reach through your own posts or targeted reach through, um, 
you know, finding, finding leads that you think you can capture and put through your funnel. Yeah. Anyone who's listening to this, this is gold. Try this. If you're looking for a job, not enough people try it. What people try to do is barely fill out their LinkedIn profile, have very little information and then go to the quick apply button and quick apply as many jobs as they can do this. Instead, you'll lead to happier jobs and a faster turnaround. I think it worked out for Mark, right? You're living proof of it. Work that worked out for me, but uh, I would love to see anyone try and maybe augment it and like share on LinkedIn yourself what you tried and what you, what you changed, what's working for you. I love it. So if you're listening, try it and then and then tell us how it went. Tag me and Mark. We want to hear. Um, that's sweet. I love. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. That's very creative, very cool. Um, we're at, we're at 50 minutes. We've been talking. Time flies and we're having fun. I want to respect yeah. your time. Um, so I just, we, one of my last questions was role of LinkedIn in your life. I think you just summarized it pretty well. Um, we'll skip this one. The last thing I want to talk about, uh, with you is your dog, but, <laughs> but before we get to your dog, we'll end it, we'll end it on a data question here. Um, yeah. Gabrielle Pasca is here and asks us this question. Do you think that potential employees in the future will be providing specific service-based solutions instead of a generic nine to five job? job hmm that's a really hard question to be honest i that's that's more so i feel like that's less of a, a data question more like a, a market trends question of like what does the future of work look like especially after the pandemic um and to be honest i don't have the answer for that but what i can say is that you know you can make anything possible if you if you if you drive and hustle so like you know some people may really love the nine to five job and that's what they go for, right? Other people may be like, I want more flexibility. And you're going to just have to have to take the risk and the creativity to create that reality for yourself. So maybe you start like an LLC and you you do consulting on the side. Uh, I mean, Avery, I think you're better equipped to answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to say, that sounds like me. Um, no, I think, I think what you said is exactly right. I think freelancing will be a bigger thing in the future. Um, I, I think like just with the gig economy, like Uber and uh, I don't know, Postmates and Airbnb. I think we are getting to more individual levels of stuff. So yeah, maybe in the future, like I'm really good at cleaning up data and that's my job. And you know, companies don't have a data scientist who does everything. They use 12 data scientists who specialize in one given thing. That could definitely be the future, but I don't see it happening until there's automated cars. So after <laughs> after after self-driving cars, that, that could be next. Um, but until then, I think the the balance where it is right now is is probably where it will stay. Although I do think more people will continue to freelance. I think that will continue to grow, but not at some crazy, like futuristic rate quite yet. And and like you said, there's there's benefits to both, you know. Um mm -hmm. both have a lot of benefits, including nine to five literally has more benefits, like literally the, the benefits part of it, you know, so. <laughs> um, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Anything else data to add? If not, I want to talk about your dog. <laughs> I love my dog so much. Okay. I, I, did, I, I did a recent post. His name's Alvis. He's a standard poodle. And uh, poodle. like I said, my wife, my wife had uh, health issues. He's trained to be a service dog for my wife. So he's oh, wow. very special for us. Um, very cool. Not only is he a loving member of our family, he has an important job of, of keeping my wife uh, safe um, and giving her independence. And so like, he just means the world to me because he helps my wife, he helps me, and also he's just super fun and cute and loving. That's that's awesome, man. I I, I knew his name was Elvis because that's a dope name, Harry Potter. If anyone shout wondering. out to my wife, my wife's a huge Harry Potter fan, so I, I didn't have a choice in naming the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good name. You didn't have to. It's a great name. I was yeah. like, all right, that sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, standard poodle. I have I have a standard golden doodle. So I was mm -hmm. wondering if you had a golden doodle, but it's a poodle. How much does Albus weigh? He's like. 50 pounds I think. oh he looked bigger in the picture 50 maybe 60 pounds yeah I, he, he's he's still pretty big but uh he uh but yeah he's only a year and a half old oh year and a half that was my next question is is age um peach my dog just turned two yesterday but she weighs oh, like fine. she weighs like 80 pounds like she's wow. big yeah she's she's a big girl i was i was curious i was like 
that looks that looks like it'd be Peach's cousin or something yeah. like that. But there you go, yeah. Albus the poodle. He's a little chicken nugget. <laughs> the color he's in. <laughs> that's that's awesome, man. Dogs are dogs are awesome. Yeah. And I'm and glad that it helps. Your also, wife like he's actually taught me a lot too for my gator career. I saw that well. post. Uh, because like I have to train him, uh, yeah. and train him good behaviors, and like dogs will tell you when you're not training them. Oh yeah. <laughs> They'll stop listening even though they know it because you have to be consistent all the time. And that's really served as a lesson like for my career. If I want really want to see things change, I need to be consistent. Yeah. Even in your uh even in what you do, right? Like if you have a model, machine learning model, and you don't retrain it, it eventually stops <laughs> working. That's yep. about where that's about where Peach is right now. She was she's she's uh she's actually gonna be, well, hopefully she's gonna she's training to be a therapy dog. Uh, oh, awesome. Yeah. So to go like to hospitals and stuff, um, yeah. she was like on the path and then we moved and like, it's just been really hard to find the time to like go out and like train with her and stuff like that just because mm -hmm. moving and setting things up. So, but now like she is, I've definitely have noticed her. We're having like model, uh, what's it called? Drift. Model drift. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like she is not listening the way she used to. So it's time to tear it down and, and retrain and, and get yeah, going the, the thing for me is we took him to the beach and took him off leash because it was an off leash beach. Uh -huh. And he just thought, oh, I can run around now. And so now it's been working on months for getting recall back. So yeah. <laughs> struggle. Yeah. Dog, dogs are fun, but then they can be fun. <laughs> they, yeah, man, they can be tough on that recall. You got you to gotta get some cheese or something like that. Yeah, he, he goes crazy for cheese. Yeah, that's my secret is whenever Peach is like being really bad. Oh, I have cheese. And then she's right there. Yeah. It's That's funny, that... he actually knows the sound of a cheese wrapper being open. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I pull anything out of the fridge, no, you won't come rushing. But the cheese stick, he knows the sound. If I touch, not even like the cheese, not even like open it. If I touch it, Peach is like, That's a cheese stick. I know it. Give it to me right now. <laughs> That that's funny, man. Well, Mark, thank you so much. Thank you for your insights. Loved hearing your story. Um I hope everyone here, I know Gabrielle just said thank you for the awesome insights. I, I second Gabrielle, like what an uh, amazing story you have. And just to hear, you know, about your, your tips for the layoff hustle. I need to go back and check out that hashtag um, and, and look at those more, more closely, but what, what awesome uh, tips for LinkedIn and finding jobs. Uh, thank you, man. Really appreciate you having you on the show. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. This, this was a blast. Yeah, we'll, we'll do it again sometime. So everyone, if you haven't connected with Mark, go ahead and connect with Mark. His link should be at least in the LinkedIn uh, description. Also, it'll be in the show notes in the podcast. And hey, let's throw the, let's throw the, job, the, the job link on there too. I know someone asked earlier, who asked earlier? Uh, Zaid said link, please. So let's throw that in. I'll throw that in the oh, show notes. Go, I think it's humu.com slash careers, right? Basically. Yeah, I can send you the actual uh, okay. to it. Sweet. Why not? Right? <laughs> yeah. All right, man. Well, take care. Thank you everyone for listening and I uh, hope you guys have an awesome Friday. See ya. Bye.